Hey, welcome to the Cam and Otis Show. On this episode, long time coming. Anticipation is great, man. I'm, I'm, yeah. I've been, I've been, I've been chomping at the bit for this because there's just so many things that uh, that Tori is doing. Tori Hart, Miss Torrance Hart, uh, is doing that. I just, I just have fun with, and it's great to see you, Tori. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and you know what? I was thinking, you know, I usually go into some sort of, and by the way, she is an Air Force veteran. I usually go into something about veteran and, and this, that, and the other. But, you know, what you do is a little bit different. So I was thinking, are you a gift giver? I mean, is is that what, I mean, are you that person that that's like, oh, here's a present, here's a present. Are, are you that person? Is that why, is that why you started uh, Teak and Twine? That is such a good question. And I really want, to tell you yes but because <laughs> I'm, I'm more in the like cobbler's children wear no shoes camp so yes my company teak and twine we are great gift givers as a team and we help companies provide gifting solutions for their sales marketing teams and their hr teams like employee gifting but don't be surprised if you get an Amazon gift card from me personally. I'm trying to do better. I really, really am. But I think that some people were inspired to do their business because it was their hobby. And there's certainly something there. Like I'm totally the little girl with the lemonade stand, a hundred percent that kid. But I think it's actually the logistics and the details of this business that I love and that attracted me. To send one gift out, you have to order inventory, bring a big team together, work with a bunch of different vendors. You get to support a ton of other small businesses to put one box together. So we might put a box together that has a chocolate bar from one company, a mug from another. So there's all these layers of logistics and details and getting to support other businesses. And I think that's actually what, what inspired me um, at the beginning. Though I did, of course, like many business owners, take a little bit of a roundabout way to where I am now. Well, that, that's a great business lesson right there, though. I mean, think about it, you know, I'm not really the gift giver. But I got people around me that are, right? I hired gift givers, absolutely. And and we have such creative people on our team that do love that. But you're you're so right that I'm so glad, actually, I've had so many moments that I've been so glad that it isn't the gifting that I love, that I would prefer to spend time in an Excel spreadsheet or figure out the details of an order or work with the sales team on their sales strategy because guess what that's that's my job now right like sometimes you start a business doing what you love and then you find that to run the business it actually takes you further away from the doing and uh so thankfully um i actually get to do more of what i love now how did you get, uh, or I guess, how did you discover the love of like the logistics and the details of that? Because I could totally see that, but I almost picture it as like you got a project in a business once and you had to send a bunch of gifts and then you kind of started nerding out on the supply chain things. Is that is that how it came, came to be or was it something different there? Kind of, super similar. So I spent some time uh, at the end of my Air Force career doing um, some event planning protocol is what it's called in the military. And so when I was transitioning out, one of the things that occurred to me is I could be an event planner because I had some experience in the Air Force doing that. As I dove into that profession and everything about it and kind of, okay, how do they market themselves? What do they do? Stocking their websites. You know, when you have a business idea and you just go mm -hmm. deep diving on the people that are doing that to kind of flesh it out and see if it's for you. And one of the things that I noticed was that couples at that time were putting together these elaborate weddings and then DIYing the gift that they would give to the folks who had flown in 
to mm -hmm. uh, thank them. The wedding welcome gifts is what they're called. And at the time there wasn't a company that was making them. So they were this 11th hour DIY project by either the couple or the planner. And there's something about that that I just liked. I liked the fact that it seemed like an untapped market, that I was noticing a trend. And so mm -hmm. the planner part kind of fell, fell away. And I said, I'm going to make these wedding welcome gifts. So that's what I did. And then it was a couple months in and a client of mine who was a bride that we made bridesmaid gifts for worked at this little company called Microsoft and contacted me asking, hey, I know you usually do bridal gifts, but would you consider working on a large scale project for our employees at Holiday? And that project was so fun and so big and so creative. And I, it kind of flipped a switch in my mind of like, wow, there's this whole other gifting world out there. And it was really fun. And then the, the more I went along, the more that we really just went into that corporate sector where now we specialize completely in large scale corporate gifting and work specifically with sales teams on client gifts or onboarding gifts with marketing teams on like virtual event gifts are really hot right now. Or we work with HR teams on, we want to reach out to our virtual employees. So yeah, I mean, from bridesmaid gifts to this, it's all boxes, it's all gifts, but it was kind of that flexibility of I'm going to be okay with listening to my clients, doing something that isn't maybe exactly what I thought I would do when I started out, being open to that, and then kind of just going where my joy took me, but also what my clients were asking for. Mm -hmm. Listening to what was that? Yeah. What was that shock like on that Microsoft order? Because from the sounds of it, I'm sure that was pretty big jump in production. Uh, you know, how much how much hair did you lose during that month or so? <laughs> so you, totally right. I had gone from basically doing six, 10 gifts at a time to 200 all at once. And like any scrappy entrepreneur, you know, um, I had a 12 year old girl who lived next door. She, she came over and helped me make them. Um, my sister helped me make them. My husband has helped me pack a shipping box or two in the very beginning for sure. But at the same time, I was also learning, okay, hold on. I sent the same number of emails to this client, but the project was 20 times bigger than other projects. And the other thing that I really loved is I had this misconception in the beginning and, and some people might have misconceptions about different niches in their business too. I had a misconception that corporate gifting was boring and I wanted to do something really creative. So I thought, okay, no, I don't want that. But this project, they gave me complete creative freedom and leeway. She was basically like, hey, I'm very busy in my job. So I need you to do this completely you know, he, here's our logo and branding. And so I actually was given more creative reins than I was on a wedding project where often they already had a lot of the elements thought out and a lot of ideas. And so I thought, hold on a second, this was a big project. It was super fun. And I was kind of wrong about what I thought about this. This is actually in some ways more creative. And, uh, and so I, I had to kind of be open to that, but there have definitely been times and thank goodness I have the personality where I am super comfortable saying yes, and then figuring out the details of how the heck I'm going to pull that off. Um, and there have definitely been times when I say yes to a project and I'm, I'm like, okay, going to need to get some people in here, going to need to figure out, you know, a storage unit. And uh, it turns out that that guest bedroom now uh, isn't a guest bedroom anymore. I'm, I'm picturing a, a living room full of boxes and in that, that weird sort of crinkle paper shredded stuff just everywhere. You know, it, it's, they're probably still pulling it out of the rug from, from uh, that first time, you know, it just, just, in that that chaos of 
oh crap <laughs> they said yes you know yeah. I, I laugh at that I, I've dealt with that in business many times on both sides of it as a as a coach and then been in it and going oh they, somebody actually says they're going to do that oh my gosh then you know you run around and got to figure it out I, I'm exactly I, I'm just thinking here do you like to put together puzzles? Is that what it is? Is that, is this, is, do you look at this as, as is this a, cause I, what? Yeah. it's like the equivalent of like the lemonade stand. You wind up, you want to have a business. It's like, you're playing with puzzles. So you got to fix the puzzle. <laughs> yeah. just, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm <laughs> picture you looking at the box and going, well, this could go, <laughs> is that? Yes. <laughs> Nailed it. I was obsessed with Tetris growing up. I played it all the time and I would say to myself like oh my gosh this is Tetris like I have all these products and I have to figure out how to put them together beautifully and like there is that really methodical part of it and then I think anyone who started a business where you create something that is a product it's so cool to see beginning of the day there was nothing end of the day, there's a pile of shipping boxes by the front door. That is so satisfying to me, like a physical manifestation of the work that I have put in. And uh, there's something really cool about that, making something with your hands, creating something like that. And, uh, and I, I still at Christmas, you know, everyone's like, aren't you supposed to be doing something else? And I'm like, yeah, but just let me tape a couple of shipping boxes shut, like get out on the line and, and do a little bit of work because it's, it's fun. How did you, and this is one of my favorite questions to ask, uh, you know, CEOs, business owners, founders is, well, all right, when did you, when did you come to the realization that husband, little girl next door and, and you ain't going to cut it? How, how, you know, when, when, when did that kind of go, you know, shock and awe, whatever you want to call it? When, what, what was that like? I completely understand. I mean, there's nothing scarier, I think, than hiring. And that first hire is super scary. First hire and moving out of the house were big for me. And um, so a big thing was I started this business while I was still active duty. And I still had a year commitment left. So someone had to pack these orders while I was at work. And we did it in the funniest way. I mean, I would go to work in the morning and an hour later, my first employee would open the door and come into my empty house and work all day. And I would come home and we would kind of brainstorm for an hour about what had happened. And then I would work until late at night and do it all again. And so basically because I was still active duty, I was pushed to that, I think sooner than I would have. Mm -hmm. I, I got orders faster than I thought I would. And I needed someone to help me put them together and someone help me answer those emails. And that first hire, she was incredible. I found her via word of mouth and she's still working with me today, seven years later. And uh, she is absolutely fantastic. She's a, an Air Force spouse as well. And she's amazing. I'm super passionate about hiring other military spouses because after I got out, I was uh, a military spouse for a while. And man, that is a tough gig. It can be hard to put a career together. And so I, I went on a little bit of a tangent there, but to answer your question, I hired out of necessity and I think I probably did that for too long, like basically waiting to hire until I'm staying up till midnight. Okay, it's time to hire as opposed to a preemptive hire where I have a clear path for that new hire on how they're going to generate revenue so that I don't see every new hire as someone who's just going to cost money. Um, I can see clearly how that new hire is actually going to open up new revenue and, uh, and grow the company. And I think once I made that switch, then it became exciting to hire instead of just scary. 
Yeah, because I think when you're hiring... When you're hiring out of necessity, and I, I, I just put this together, it sounds like you probably put this together. When you're hiring out of necessity, you're like just kind of trying to avoid the pain of the situation. And when you're doing that, you're not going to make as good of a decision as if you're in that proactive state of mind, like you're saying. Exactly right. Like you're just looking at your PL and going, okay, where's the money for this hire going to come from? And, you know, how am I going to pull it off? Instead of thinking, wait, what could they do for me that sure frees up my life, allows me to, to have more time. And maybe that marketing thing that I've never gotten around to, or that sales strategy that I've never been able to do, or, you know, all of those things, right? Like think, thinking positively about a new hire and not just what they're going to take away, but what they could add to your business, add to your, add to your life too. Did you have an epiphany or was it kind of a, a almost a, a, a slow sort of thing, you know, because that, that is, that's a huge shift in mindset. Oh, gosh, that's a great question. I, uh, epiphany-ish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I think what happened is for the, for the first time I, I hired someone and it was kind of a, I'm going to leap because I really believed in this person and I kind of hired from the heart instead of from PNL. And I just really believed in this person. And then instantly she changed so much about the business and taught me so much and brought so many opportunities to the table that I just realized, oh my goodness, I have been walking around with a ball and chain on my ankle by not doing this sooner. And then I did it again and it happened again. Another amazing person who, you know, brought all these new ideas and create creativity. And, uh, and then I kind of realized, wait a second, all those people were right. <laughs> a good hire can, absolutely, you know, change your business. And you should hire people who are smarter than you and all those cliches that you hear, but are just terrifying to actually do. Well, I'm, I'm going to, that's all rainbows and unicorns. So have you, have you had somebody in the team that was like, Ooh, big mistake. You don't have to name names, <laughs> but, but you can, but you can. <laughs> I have had to let people go and that sucks. You're absolutely right. It sucks. And my mini epiphany with that was that it's not about me and it's not about that person. So when I was considering having to do it, I couldn't stop thinking about how I would feel through this process and how this other person would feel through the process. And as long as I was stuck in thinking those two things, it made it really, really hard. Mm. And as soon as I thought about how the rest of my team was affected by this hire, and it made it actually, it's not about me. It's about, this is my responsibility to make everyone's work easier and to give other people the support that they need mm -hmm. it became it was instantly it was like clouds parted it was like oh yeah this is going to be hard and sucky but it's absolutely not about you and mm -hmm. your job right now is to do this for other people um and then you know i i kind of i have uh you know an awesome dad too cam and you know I called him and he basically was, you know, told me in the nicest way, like, yeah, this is, this is why they pay you the big bucks, like mm -hmm. moments like this. So get out there. <laughs> in, uh, in those earlier days you were talking about where you were still working, you're still in the air force and you're bringing, bringing some people on to help on stuff and you're gone all day. 
Were you stressing a lot at work? Because to me, one of the things we talk about all the time with different entrepreneurs is like having control over your outcome and how important that is as a business owner, because then you can control what the customer is getting and being at work all day while someone else does the job seems like it is like the opposite of controlling the outcome. So what was that like from like a stress level and then a little bit more into the business side of like the managing that kind of a stress? Absolutely. So I think that this has happened to me with a few different hires where I think I'm going to have to, you know, watch everything that they do and you train them, right? You do the old military, like left seat, right seat. And then hopefully if it's a good hire, an amazing thing happens, which is they do something on their own and it's so much better than you. So much better than you could ever write. And like you trained them to do it like a seven out of 10. And then they bring back a 10 out of 10 and they're like, Hey, is this okay? Can I send this to the client? And you're like, okay, yeah, it's going to be fine. <laughs> and, uh, and that's basically what happened. Like you're, you're right. I really thought, um, I care a lot about our brand voice and how we talk to clients. I'm pretty obsessed with that. So when I hire someone and they're going to communicate with clients, that's one of the scariest things for me. And so, you know, we, we did a lot of training and the first five emails she showed me before she hit send. Right. And we talked about how we might change it. And then she started bringing me emails that like, Oh, we're not just, you know, how I wanted it to be done but brought in a unique insight or were mm -hmm. empathetic in a way that I maybe hadn't even thought. And, and then I just, I felt great about it. I mean, she, she did a fantastic job and it was, I was happy when it was, when I could go full-time, I was very happy when I was, I could go full-time and, and we could work together every day for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, that, that's the great moment, right? When, when you hire people and they do it even better than you. Yeah. yeah well, How I, have you, I, I'm just going to jump on the five email because, uh, that's, <laughs> not very many. that's uh that's a pretty good trust factor already <laughs> right there. Uh, so you must, yeah. you know, that's the, I wouldn't quite say the needle in the haystack, but dead gum, that's, that's good. <laughs> It was seven years ago, may have been 10 emails. Um, but yeah, she's, she's an incredible communicator, which is why she's still with me seven years later. Um, she really knows how to communicate with clients for sure. Oh, uh, what I was gonna say is dad, I know you and I are very much in the trial by fire. Uh, I blanking on who your boss was, but I know you've told the story before the podcast of just you getting, you get in there. I think it was in Afghanistan. He just said, Hey, Otis, here's your job. Don't F it up. Call me if you need me. Uh, I know I had the exact same experience with uh, uncle Ben on the farm, you know, second day there running the dairy. I was like, Hey, I got to go into town. Call me if something's wrong and just go do it. And so Torrance, how do you balance giving that kind of a freedom, but then still having the training aspect. Because especially in what you're talking about, if you give them that freedom, there's that big opportunity for improvement there, which is like the thing that you want to get out of those new hires. But then also, you know, like you said, five emails isn't, isn't that long. So this, this thing that you're talking about is the biggest, hardest lesson I learned in the past year. And I, I, try to read leadership things. And a lot of it is from ex-military. And one of the things I hear over and over is that good leaders give intent, but not the details. They tell their people what they want to accomplish, but not how to do it. And that way they're opening the door for uh, ingenuity and creativity and, uh, and ownership. Well, I took it too far for sure. And I definitely had some hires last year where I gave all the intent in the world. And then I just threw them to the wind and said, aren't I an awesome leader giving my people so much freedom? And they made some mistakes. And then I finally came to them and said, hey, do you want me to, 
tell you how I do X, Y, Z. And then, you know, you can iterate off of that. And, you know, hey, I don't mean to step on any toes and I don't want to micromanage. And they didn't say this, but their body language said this. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you, could you please, could you please provide some, you know, framework here and maybe, maybe do tell people, hey, here's how we've been doing this for five years. And how about start there? And then if you feel free to iterate on it, to improve mm -hmm. upon it, like here is my intent. And um, so, so yeah, like I love that you brought that up because that is one of my huge lessons, like finding that balance between giving people ownership and not letting that idea basically be a cop-out on providing leadership and training. Yeah, that, that's that's so true. And you know, and we want to do that, right? We want to just say, hey, I need this thing over there done. And you know, go do it. And we're thinking, yeah, I could, I could, I was probably standing right there next to you and you know in that same thing at some point in various points in my life, you know, even back in the army. And then you they come back and they say, Is is this it? Or it's just you know, and you're like, whoa, <laughs> dude, dude, let's, let's, uh, let's talk. And then you realize, well, maybe I never really showed them, you know, uh -huh. you yeah. know, it's, it's the, you know, it, it's the plan, right? What, what's the plan? What's the standards? And, and yeah, when you're, when you're running and gunning and you think, man, I'm developing these people to be, you know, the next director of packaging and the next you know, vice president of sale, blah, 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 all these sort of things. We've got these grandiose ideas and we never show them how to do it. So I, first off, I'll tell you, good on you to actually step in because there's a lot of folks out there that would that would go into uh, the passive aggressive leader mode, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, mm -hmm. maybe talking to the salesperson about the way the packing people are screwing it up or, and, and then flipping it around later on and talking to the person that's packing about how, how the salesperson's emails are, man. That, it, so yep. is that, is that something in your core, you know, or all right, you're going to have some tough conversations here or, or did you learn that in this trial and error? Oh, I totally learned it trial and error. I, I learned it by, by people who were super bright and super talented and so I didn't give them enough direction. I didn't train them enough. I patted myself on the back for being such a trusting leader. And then I wasn't happy with the outcome. And my first inclination was to be frustrated. And then as I thought through, okay, how's this conversation gonna go? Then I kind of realized, Oh, I never told them how I do it. I never gave them a standard. I never took the time to train them. Um, and so, and then I, I uh, talked to my dad about it. Um, you know, he's, he's totally the Otis to my cam. And, <laughs> and I said, you know, dad, I, I've been reading about this, like, don't want to micromanage and give people direction, but how do I bridge this gap here? And he said exactly what you just said, which is you still have to give them the training that they need and you still have to give them the standard. And that probably all those people who are saying, give them the intent, but not the how are, are still providing the roadmap and the best practices and the five years of lessons learned and then taking a step back and, mm -hmm. and letting people bring some creative freedom to, to the how. Yeah, I'm laughing because I'm thinking of the irony of the, you know, what's the military do? You know, uh -huh. you walk that path in the military. Nope. All right. Take off them civilian clothes, get your hair cut, put this on. This is the way you put it on. They, they walk you through all this stuff. And then we throw that out the window and we go figure, ah, you know, they probably got it. They're probably good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's a great, that's a great life, life slash business lesson. 
Well, I think uh, I was, if you saw me staring off the distance, I had this thought of how similar this is. And dad, you'll, you'll really connect on this of thinking of coaching rugby, the drill and game design. uh, One of the fundamental things that I've learned uh, is the, like giving them the freedom in the game. Like you design a game and you say, okay, Hey, do you score down there, go out of bounds, turn over and you know, this, and you give them like three rules. You say, go. And the kids run around and then they break a bunch of rules. You go, okay, hey, how about now? Hey, this rules, and you know, now we got to add this rule. And I was thinking like, that works really well. Why doesn't that kind of a system work as well in a business? And I think what it comes down to is having the culture where people are able to question or feel comfortable questioning. Not, not, that, not that you were Tory were, you know, like no questions, this is how you do it. Obviously you weren't, but that if the person doesn't have the confidence to ask the questions, you know, like same thing as the little kids that I coach with engage going, what happens if I drop the ball and I say, Oh, easy. Then it's the other team's ball. Like, but if they never ask the question, then they're never going to learn on that. So I think it's giving them the room to, you know, mess it up and like have that, that growth, but then you have to have that kind of a culture of being able to ask those questions and have that kind of communication because then otherwise, you know, you get the person who's just banging their head against the wall And if they had just asked you one question, it would have been completely different. Exactly. But the thing is, is who knows what questions that person should be asking? You know the question. Mm -hmm. So it's like the algebra teacher that sits there and goes, any questions? No? Perfect. Everyone must understand it perfectly. Mm -hmm. Whereas you need to know like, okay, they don't know what questions to ask, but I know what questions they should be asking. And I shouldn't take a lack of questions as an indication of understanding. Like that's why Mm -hmm. there's left seat, right seat. And it's more like, okay, you might not know the question. So you do it and I'm going to sit here next to you. And I bet you're going to come up with some questions. Mm -hmm. And I would even say from, you know, taking like my coaching example is then you as the leader ask some of those questions. Like if, if I've definitely done that before where it's like, okay, Hey, well, what happens? You run out of bounds and a kid will look, well, what do you guys think happens? And then one of them will say like, yeah, that's it. And then it's like, okay, good. But it's like knowing it's almost like having that list of the 10 questions that, you know, they probably should ask and then having that ready to go if they stall out like that. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, just, just like where there's a meeting and I want to, I want everybody to feel comfortable bringing up stuff that might not be going wrong. So me first, here are three things that might not be going right. And then, you know, the, the ideas flow. And which, which leads me to my, my other favorite deep thought provoking founder question is, is how did you establish the the core values? You know, because there, there's a point where your actions are the core values, but then there's that point where it has to be more than that. So how, how did you know where where's that at in your growth, your business, Deacon right Twine's growth? Over your left shoulder. My left, which one? Crazy horse. Uh, uh, traction. Ah, oh. <laughs> I'm a big EOS fan. And luckily I got, um, I was introduced to that system and that book right around the time that I need it, right around the time that we were Mm. moving from being a totally flat organization where I didn't need to talk about culture because there were five of us and we shared the same room and we didn't have meetings because we just blurted out any thought that we had. And we didn't have organizations because each team was a one person team, right? So everything was just so easy. And then in a year we went from five to 10 and, you know, thank goodness. That's also when we implemented um, the entrepreneurial operating system, which highly recommend that book, but it really lays out the framework for how do you get 10 people in a room and establish what your core values as a company are, where, what your 10 year strategy is, what your marketing plan is, what kinds of customers do you want? Where do you want to be in a year? Where do you want to be in a quarter? Where do you want to be in a month? What does Sally need to do this week to get to there? 
it's not rocket science. It's just goal setting. It's just breaking down big goals into small ones, mm -hmm. but they, they create a system and they make it really easy to understand. And so, you know, we do our scorecard meetings every Thursday, everyone's got their metrics. We have really stuck with it four years in. And I mean, I tell people it's the closest thing to magic that I've seen in business. That's, that's, I love that because you're getting everybody on the same sheet by doing that. And uh, yeah, Traction is a great book and uh, glad, you know, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So however that book fell in your lap, I mean, it was the right time, right? Because if you'd read it a year before, you'd been like, oh, that's kind of cool. Put it up on the shelf, you know, sit next to mine up on the shelf. <laughs> and when it, when those things happen, because I've we've had a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurs on the show and, and very many of them, have had that same sort of epiphany moment where it's this, this book, this, you know, group or this course or, or this, even this phrase was like at the right moment and made that, that change. And I guess, I guess where I'm going with this is, is what is the, you know, this kind of goes back to that, that core thought of, of where you're from, of, of being open to that, you know, where, you know, the, I mean, you joked about the lemonade stand. I probably should ask, did you actually have one? Uh, oh so yeah. Yes. Good for you. Good. But for you. no one told me to put water in lemonade. So I just squeezed lemons and, and um, I received some immediate customer feedback. And you listened. There's a, there's a great business lesson. You don't often have to, you know, get to see that feedback that's so immediate. Like, you know, if you're listening to this, you won't see my lemon face, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, where, did, where did that start though? I mean, you know, you, you got it from the lemonade stand, you know, that instant customer feedback, which was uh, obviously left a deep impression on you. Uh, <laughs> but the, the willingness to learn and, and change, adopt and change, where, where did that start? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I think in business, you really have to, right? Um, if something's not working, maybe it's that I love, love, love the feedback loop mm. of learning something, implementing it, and seeing it work. So maybe I don't think of it as a negative feedback loop, like iterating off of mistakes as much as that is an incredible possibility that I could read something today and change something tomorrow and see results next week. And that it's really my number one job in running this business, I feel like right now is to learn stuff and, and bring those ideas. And the first time, you read something or get an idea in the shower or while driving. Those are like my two places that I get ideas the most. And, uh, and I'll go into my team and I'll be like shower thoughts. And they're like, uh Oh, but no, they're like, okay, let's hear it. And then we do something and it works. It's just this incredible moment of, especially coming from the military, such a huge organization to come to some place where you can immediately change how everything is done, hopefully for the better. That's, a, that's great. And I love the flexibility in that. And that's one of the things that uh, it's always so fun at this stage of your business, uh, which, which makes me think, all right, so everybody talks about it. What's the, what's the, what's the bureaucracy you're creating? And, and notice I used the, the scary word. What's the bureaucracy you're creating in Teak and Twine to make it continue to grow successfully? Yes, so we have three teams. We have a marketing team head, uh, led by a director of marketing, an operations team head by a director of operations, and a sales team, and that's the one I've hung on to. So I'm still sitting in the director of sales role in addition to CEO position. And um, so those are the three teams. It, it's a very common uh, breakdown. And each of those teams, I have a weekly meeting with 
each of them to kind of dive deep into those. We have a couple of meetings where two teams are meeting weekly, like sales and ops to talk about when orders are going out. Sales then meets with marketing once a week so that they can strategize, how is this messaging working? What does our pipeline look like? What kinds of things are clients asking for? Talk to us about the client voice and kind of uh, get some of that uh, inner team communication going. And then we have our weekly scorecard meeting, which is company-wide, where each team is talking about their biggest metrics, their biggest numbers, and we're kind of talking team-wide uh, what's working on a weekly basis. I love that. Love that. You know, and good, good for you to figure that out and, and just not get too scared of the word bureaucracy because <laughs> everybody everybody in the small business world is like oh you know i don't want to no it's the only way it's going to work man it's, 100%. It's, yeah, yeah and i thought you know i really didn't want to have meetings because i wanted to be the cool boss like i wanted to be the nice boss and i and i just kept hearing everyone hates meetings and it was my team actually that's just said can we just have a meeting so that we can figure? So and I said, oh, wait, you guys want a meeting? And they were like, yes, please. <laughs> we got stuff to talk about, lady. And, uh, and so, you know, in one year, we went from no meetings to like five weekly, you know, we probably, we went to like eight weekly meetings and then pulled back a little bit. And we mm -hmm. found our happy medium, I think, uh, where we are now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> again, another word that people will label as bad, but if done right, it serves a purpose, right? I mean, that's the only way to only way to move forward. Because like you said, and, and you use one of my favorite analogies, y'all were, there was five of you, and you were sitting around the kitchen table doing everything. Mm -hmm. right? So there's no need to have a meeting, because what are you doing all day, every day, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, you throw in a sixth person, and a seventh, and it's like, wait a second, we, we don't all fit around the table no more. So <laughs> guess what, right? Man, uh, I, I'm excited and I'm thinking of all the times that, dang it, but dang it in the, I should have in the past, but now thinking going forward, I need some Teak and Twine action. Uh, and I'm not, <laughs> sorry, I, I, I'm also thinking about the twine I got sitting on the shelf in the garage too, but uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's there's a lot of goodness to that uh which before I, and i was just about to go into my my what i learned but it I, I, something this just popped into my head what what would you say is your your purpose of teak and twine do you do you do you have that absolutely that with us? all I'm right so ready for that question so i would say we have two purposes one is like an internal compass and one is a customer facing compass. Customer facing, our mission is to, uh, is a joyful gifting experience. And we love thinking about that because we want it to be joyful for our team mm -hmm. for all the way through production. We want recipients of our gifts to have that be a joyful experience. And we want our clients to have a joyful experience working through us. And also if your goal is to book more meetings through gifting or to uh, get more client referrals through gifting, then part of that joy is gonna be it working. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that also helps make it joyful. And then internally, we call it Worktopia, where we are really leaning hard into this experiment of how amazing of a life we can create for 14 people and how much work-life balance we can give them. And so we're frankly doing some stuff here that companies our size are not dreaming of. I mean, a, a lot of it is super common now. Like we do four day work weeks, uh, one day a week working from home, unlimited PTO. This summer, everybody gets a week off, June, July, and August. 
You can work from another country for a month if you want. So we have people taking a month off in May and working from the French Alps or Hawaii. We have complete understanding of popping into a Zoom call. And listen, the world has changed, right? So lots of places are like this, which is awesome, which is Zoom calls with a sick baby. And I'm, you know, kids are screaming in the background and that's okay. And and just any ideas that people can have of what would make this not just a better work, but create Worktopia and our version of that. And, and what we're creating there. I love that. I love that. And, and notice, Camden, she said screaming kids, not barking dogs. Just just so you know. I was waiting for them to start barking when she said that, because this is usually when they get started. <laughs> yeah, they, right at the end of the episode. Like, <laughs> that's their cue. They're like, whoa, hey. <laughs> they hear me talk about what I learned, and they're like, all right, dad's ready. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they probably have. They're smarter enough dogs. I, I guarantee they have. Uh, yeah, and, and speaking of what you learn, uh, what did you learn? Yes, you can. So uh, <laughs> my my favorite one, uh, Tori, you said this earlier, is you sometimes as a leader can give freedom as like an excuse to not be a leader. And that was just like so eye-opening to me because I think I've definitely done that. I can think about a few times I've definitely done that where I was like, got to let them go make their own mistakes. Then you're just watching them fail because you don't want to go lead. It's like, come on. that's So I love that. That was very eye-opening to me. That's, that's a big one for today. How about you, Deb? Yeah, for me, it was uh, hiring from the heart, not PL. That's That's such a, a good way of thinking about it. You know, I talk about it in a lot of other things when I'm talking with clients about, you know, looking for opportunities and, and, and having a vision, but that falls right into it. And, and the reason that you're hiring somebody is, is that, and I think it helps you find the right person because if you're hiring at PL, then you're you're looking at, all right, who can I get for 20 bucks an hour, right? I mean, it's that sort of a sense instead of how can that person, how can I bring in the right person that makes the team better, that helps us grow the business and have more success in the business? That's a great way of putting it, and I appreciate that. So, Tori, what'd you learn? So, first of all, I just love this dynamic that you guys have, and I think it's so cool that the first thing is it makes me want to call my dad more. I mean, I mentioned him a couple of times and it, and it, it really is awesome. And he has never run a business, but gives me great advice all the time. And then, uh, you know, kind of just having that conversation again with you guys about, uh, about your responsibility as a leader to train and teach. I mean, I hate to steal yours, Cam, but just kind of uh, going back to that conversation, it made me, you know, think about, okay, reassess. And am I still doing, doing that to the best of my ability? We had some new team members come on during the holiday season, which is a super busy time. And uh, we don't do the training then that we should. We throw them right into the fire. So have they ever, you know, gotten the training that they should get or, you know, should I take a moment now and make sure that everybody here now has gotten the training, not just on what they do, right, but on our core values, on our mission, mm -hmm. on that, that North Star type stuff in the business. That's great. That's great. How, how do folks get in touch with you, learn more about what's going <laughs> on with, uh, with Teak and Twine? So one of our favorite places to hang out is on LinkedIn. Um, we love having conversations there and, uh, and you know, giving some great advice on how folks can use gifting to grow their business. And so we're on Teak and Twine at, or on LinkedIn at Teak like the wood and Twine like the string sitting on that shelf of yours. And, uh, and of course we're on the web at the same teakandtwine.com and you can uh, check out our beautiful gifts or get in touch with us just to brainstorm some gifting strategy for your team. Oh, that's great, Tori. This is, this has been great. Uh, I'd almost say well worth the wait, but that's kind of odd, but uh, you know what? It still was worth the wait getting you on the show. I really appreciate your time today. Same here. Lovely to be here. Talk soon. Yeah. Yeah. Camden, run us out.
Thank you all for listening to today's show. Special thanks to our guest, Tori Hart, for joining us today and our sponsor, Tribe and Purpose. Find your tribe, find your purpose. You can check out recent episodes of the Cam and Otis Show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and check out a full archive at thecaminotashow.buzzsprout.com. The Cam and Otis Show is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks again. We'll see you all next week.